Steph. So tell us a little oh, well. bit about your background and how did you get into wanting to be an AFL football player? Yeah, it's a good question um, because obviously born 88, um, mad loving Carlton um, family, which is contradictory to this right now. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, um, very proud Italian family, oldest of four children, um, really close knit family, big family, as you can imagine. We used to go to the football every week. Um, so that sparked my interest with football very young. I was a member from day dot um, at the Carlton Footy Club and we used to go and sit in the same seats every week and watch every game and <laughs> just really crazy, as you can imagine. Um, so that sparked my love for footy. I was always running around kicking the ball at our family functions. We do annual ones, we do Easter ones, you know, the, the Italian thing. And <laughs> people used to say to Dad, gee, I wish she was a boy. Um, she'd get drafted if she was a boy. And back then it made sense because there was no sort of women's footy out there. And um, Dad's like, yeah, yeah, well, you know. Um, so I loved footy from a young age. Um, grew up, did athletics, basketball, hockey, everything else, as you can imagine. Um, and just loved sport, but um, could never play football. Didn't know there was a, a competition available. Mm. Um, wasn't until high school, played in the high school team, broke my nose. Mum wasn't happy with oh. that. Thought it was a bit rough, still broken, by the way. Points <laughs> east-west. Um, <laughs> yeah, now that I've brought your attention to it, you're all staring at it. It does go that way, it's been cracked three times. Um, yeah, so I wanted to play. It was teenage years, I wanted to play football and I played at school, but I said, there's a di team called Diamond Creek out from where I was from. Can I play? And mum and dad said, no, absolutely not. You'll snap in half. And I was probably smaller than what I am now. Um, clearly very muscular now. No. <laughs> um, so they were really reluctant to let me play. Um, and I kept begging for years and years. Got to year 12, which is obviously a very important year. And mum and dad said, sure, you can go play football. Um, so that was the end of my year 12 because once you're invested in something, you know, it's very hard to, when you love something so much, it's very hard to then focus on something else. So um, I was okay at school. I was a bit of a cheeky kid, a um, bit of banter. I think that's just my personality. Um, could have achieved better grades, but really didn't work very hard. Um, missed out on the course I wanted. So missed out on PE teaching and, and health and just thought, what am I going to do? So when I did a traineeship, those sports ready ones that the AFL ran, where you're like an assistant in a school, get paid absolutely nothing, but um, got to be, do sport all day, which was pretty cool. Mm. Um, started playing football, obviously, for Diamond Creek. Um, we were pretty successful then. And then, um, so you mentioned, someone mentioned Daisy Pierce before, um, played against her team, Darabin Falcons, in eight grand finals, lost seven. So oh. I've always been in a bit of a battler team. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, so just love football, played football, never thought it'd go anywhere. You know, you represent the state, which was a big honour. Mm. Um, you know, there was all Australian teams selected from that. Was very lucky to be selected in every one of those teams when I represented the state. So that was pretty cool. Um, remember 2012, we had a high performance camp um, and Sam Lane actually spoke to us, the reporter at that camp, and she was so passionate about women's football and we were just, you know, in awe of you know, the facilities could be travel around and looked at the MCG and Icon Park and those sorts of things. And it was just really, really different to Diamond Creek. Um, when I first started Diamond Creek, we were on the smaller oval in Diamond Creek. So I don't know if anyone knows the area. There's a commentary Hurst oval. Hursty, great. We trained at Hurstbridge. I'll tell you about that in a sec too. Gee, that's cold out there. Um, <laughs> big oval, Diamond Creek, small oval for the girls and juniors. We had to get changed at the YMCA gym couldn't get user change rooms there. We had to train at Hurst Bridge every now and then. There was a shed up on the hill, had to get change in the shed. Um, that was 2006, oh. seven, eight. So yeah, really different to where we are today, obviously. I, I do consider myself lucky in terms of where I am now because there's a lot of women that played footy before me that um, paved the way, but mm. you know, never got to, to you know, reach these heights. So you've probably heard of um, people like Debbie Lee. I don't know if these names ring a bell. Debbie Lee, um, Jan Cooper is over in WA. Shiloh Curtis has got a bit to do here. Peter Searle is coaching at St Kilda, the men's, um, but now the women's coach. And, you know, they all played and put, all, put, you know, put our name forward and didn't get to play at AFLW level. So um, I think we're pretty lucky to be doing what we're doing mm. uh, off the hard work, back of hard work from them. Um, and then, so yeah, that was sort of like mid twenties and then was fortunate enough to represent the Bulldogs, um, in the exhibition series. So Western Bulldogs in Melbourne were the first to sort of get around women's football. You've probably heard of Susan Alberti. Yeah. She, um, kept, yeah, she mm. kept the Victorian women's football league as it was known then alive. She would 
come to an event like this um, and then go, oh, here's a $20,000 check. Um, and that kept us afloat. So she's really the, probably the reason why we are here today. Um, so we had these Western Bulldogs in Melbourne. We had a draft. We went to the MCG. It was like a pick one to Melbourne, pick two to the Western Bulldogs, which was pretty cool. I came off a, a good season and was pick two behind Daisy, who was pick one. Um, and yeah, represented the Bulldogs, captained them for three years. And then it was AFLW time and didn't get selected by the Bulldogs. They had a chance to sign two girls prior to the season. So it's all a little bit. So the eight clubs at the time could sign two marquee players. Um, and you know, the be best of the best and they get the big wage and those sorts of things. And then they had a chance to sign a priority pick. So it's someone who's either working within the club or has, you know, played for your club or something like that. So naturally um, everyone thought I'd be picked by the Bulldogs. Um, I wasn't, I didn't play very well, but they opted to go with someone a little bit younger and who's a better footballer. Um, so I had to go to the draft and, you know, thankfully Collingwood picked me up with pick 11 and here I am today. Here you are today. Yeah. Day amazing. But that's, the, that's the story. Yeah. Well, yeah. So what was it like when you ran out? Yeah, the first. the very first. Yeah, the first, the just to paint a picture, 2017 round one was Feb 2, I think it was. Um, Carlton Collingwood, so against the old foe. Um, back to the draft though, Dad, actually, there's a documentary on a, a league of her own. I don't know if you've seen it, but I, I'm in that, but not just to watch it for me, but the way Angela Pippos sort of put that together. Yep. Um, actually filmed me at the draft and you see me crying like a baby. But um, Dad actually wore a Carlton top underneath his polo, oh. just in case, because they had the two picks after that. And then we went to the club, Collingwood, and he's getting photos out the front pointing at his Carlton top anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, well, yeah, so uh, round one, um, lo I'd lost my granddad, so he was a big part of my, obviously, upbringing and yeah. mad Carlton. I remember running onto the ground and they expected maybe 10,000, 15,000 people and there was a lockout, as we know, so there was 25,000 people um, ran out. You couldn't, it was just so loud, you couldn't hear each other speak. Ran past, we came out first, ran past the Carlton banner where you know the cheer squad the whole banner they started booing us and I'm like oh I used to be you like <laughs> don't do that to me I looked at you know where the seats were that we used to sit and I actually um I keep the first ever point in AFLW no one remembers that everyone oh, thinks that knows the goal but that should I, be on your bio I know right no one cares <laughs> thank you yeah go me <laughs> that needs to um, be on your bio yeah actually I had the first free kick for and first kick and kick the first point but you know we always worry about the goal, that's fine. Um, <laughs> and it was down that end where uh, my non or granddad used to sit, so that was pretty cool. But yeah, 25,000 people, a lockout, that would have been amazing. bizarre. They reckon there was actually more in there. I think they snuck people in. Yeah. So there's actually, yeah, there's a bit of talk that was close to 30, but amazing. you know, I'll let that slide. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah, so it's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> so that was bizarre, bizarre, mm. yeah. So being made captain is a real honor. Mm. So do you feel like you've been a leader your whole life? Have you, always, have you always played leadership roles or is it something that you've developed into? I think probably developed, I do, I, I do recall my year seven teacher saying to me one day, you know, you will be a school captain and I laughed because um, I was a pretty cheeky kid. <laughs> but I think um, my ability to build relationships is what she was referring to. So I knew that I was able to build a rapport with people pretty well. Um, but. I suppose I was a, well, I was end up being a sports vice captain um, and then captain of Diamond Creek and those sorts of things. But it's something I've developed. You sort of get thrown in the deep end. Um, there's no real training. I don't know who I was talking to before, but there's no real training in that, in that area. And you get thrown in the deep end and you kind of just got to sink or swim. And I think that's what helped me to be a leader at Collingwood, mm. um, coming off the back of being the captain of the Bulldogs, which was a genuine shock for me. Um, because the, the girls voted in and that meant a lot to me. Amazing. So I think we in the past it was just the coach would pick probably the best player or one of the best players, but we actually voted. Mm. Um, so that meant a lot to me and I think probably didn't have a lot of self-belief in at the Bulldogs. There was a lot of superstars around me and um, so that was nice to, to have validation that way, but it's definitely something I've developed over okay. time because there's so many facets to it and especially at Collingwood. Yeah. yeah teacher by day or coordinator by day, mm -hmm. then you're training at night yep. and then you're home really late and <clears> then repeat. 
Mm. So I think it's really well known that, you know, women do have to work harder mm -hmm. um, to get where they want to get in a lot of situations. And that's our landscape and that's what we're dealing with. So I'm really interested to know how do you keep going yep. when you know what it's like on the other side yep. and um, how do you keep your spirits high and just keep your mindset right yep. to just keep on doing what you're doing? Yep. Yeah, well, the schedule's pretty full, not mm. busy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm very full. Um, I, I genuinely love what I do. I love teaching and, you know, I didn't work for you, work hard for four years at uni to sort of give that away. Mm. So I'm very passionate about teaching, but I actually think it goes hand in hand with football, especially with the leadership side of things. Um, I suppose it's a bigger picture for us. Like we know that we are, you know, changing the world or changing Australian culture at least. Um, and paving the way for those girls that can now, you know, they're born and they have a choice. You know, can they go and play football? Absolutely. So I think for me, that's what keeps me going because I know it's mm. not about me now. Um, it's not about us now, but it's about the future. And um, I suppose equality in, in a sense, it won't get there in my lifetime probably. Um, we've got, a, there's a big gap, especially in football. You remember this game's been around for hundreds of years and even at Collingwood, like they do a great job to integrate us, but you know, it's, it's hard work when yeah. you've, it is a boys club, mm. um, but now there's um, four elite, well, four women's teams at that club. So the netball, um, AFLW, the VFLW, and then the Tasmanian netball. So there's actually more women's teams at Collingwood than men's. So um, yeah, that's what keeps me going because it's not about me, it's about, you know, everybody else and just making sure that that little girl who's born has equal opportunities in sport in particular. Yeah. Mm. So you're making it easy for those who are following behind you. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Is that, how does it make you feel? Yeah, it's interesting because role models thrown around that, that phrase all the time, but it's probably something once I'm done with my career that I'll look back on and reflect on. Like right now, because I'm living it, it's kind of like, no, nah, that'd be silly. Like that's just part and parcel. I'm that's doing what I do. Yeah, and one of the, one of the best questions I got asked, um, Nick Maxwell, ex Collingwood, well, Collingwood captain, premiership captain, he runs our leadership forums and he asked me a question he said, who's following you? And it was a really interesting question, very simple, but I just, that made me think um, and it sort of changed my whole perspective on, on football and mm. especially in a team that was so young mm. and not winning. So. Not winning. Mm. Not but you learn hard. a lot when you're not winning. Yeah, but it's so much nicer to win. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I must admit it. <laughs> Really, <laughs> it's 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 difficult not winning because not because of the external pressure, but just when you've got girls that just work so hard and are mm. not getting any results and their little faces looking at you. Yeah, it's really hard, and you have to speak at the end of the game, which I d would do anyway. But it's nicer when you win because you don't have yeah. to really think about what you're saying. Yeah, <laughs> so exactly. Yeah. So can you share some of the challenges that you have faced into as you've been sort of moving through? and I suppose creating that path with the AFLW. Mm. Is there challenges that you've faced with the guys? Is there challenges you've faced with, pu with the public, with the expectation, mm. with your own expectations yeah, that yeah. you put on yourself? Yep. Um, well, obviously mental health is really, really important. And I think there's a lot of people calling out trolls and those sorts of things. Mm. You would have seen with the Taylor Harris photo, mm. the one with the big kick. Like I think she handled herself brilliantly. She's mm. only 20, 21. Um, very young girl, but handled herself really well. Um, those are the challenges we face, and I try not to pay too much attention of online stuff. I don't read any forums. I certainly don't read about myself because it's probably not flattering when you don't play well. Um, but just, yeah, ignoring the external noise, I think is really important. And even, even so, I was saying to someone before, doing media after games or when you're losing, that is a big challenge for us. Um, and being told you're too positive because you are looking at the positive, that, that really irks me, um, especially with the young group. Um, but yeah, just those naive comments that people make, you know, every now and then it's, it's changing. But I remember when I started, oh, what sport do you play? Oh, football. Yeah, soccer. No, no, I play football. Oh, do you, does it hurt when you mark it on your chest? Like little oh. things like that. And that's way back when, but that's, you just got to get a bit sassy. So that's when I was like, well, no, you, you always learn to mark it out in front, not on your chest. What are you doing? Like I just turned <laughs> yeah. it back on them. Um, but yeah, they're the little challenges you face. But you mentioned before, like I coach in our AFL program at school. So I look after year seven to 10 boys and girls, mainly boys. And they don't see me as a 
female mm. coach. They just see me a coach that happens to be female. Mm. And I think that culture That's awesome. is changing. And there's a mm. lot more um, girls that are coaching and getting into that side of things. So do you think that, so I'll touch on the um, social media space in a minute, because that can be a very, very cruel world, mm. not only for athletes, but for for especially for the younger generation growing up. But mm. um, so it sounds like you protect yourself from that mm. by not reading. But um, in terms of the discrimination um, that you probably face within the industry, and especially as it was progressing through the um, AFLW, is it something that you were looking for in terms of, okay, so what are people saying? Or is it just something that you just forged through? with because I think yeah. some people look for it yes and yep. will find it yep and that supports their oh I'm being discriminated against and and doesn't necessarily support their um confidence yeah yeah yep yeah. um I think forging through like I've to be fair I haven't really come across a lot of it um but pushing through it and, and ignoring not giving it oxygen I mm. think those people are slowly becoming the minority the people yep. that are actually hurling that abuse or discriminating against women in sport mm. um but yeah, there's ways to deal with it and it's not even discrimination. Like I know I got suspended la late last year in, in our season. It sounds like I'm a thug, Damn. I'm not. What did you um, do? Yeah, I, just clumsy. I took a girl out and, you know, she had a busted head and she's okay. Um, it wasn't intentional, but I remember like giving my phone to my best friend and I said, go through my Instagram and Twitter yeah. and delete everything because I had death threats. I had this, you're, yeah, it was unbelievable. So those... Yeah, men, just you're disgusting, you know, what you shouldn't be playing anyway, go die, I'm going to hit you, uh, yeah, stuff like wow. that. Yeah, pretty bizarre and we actually, it's funny because usually I'd go through all that but I'd learnt from my other teammate who got suspended early in the year um, who was really upset with one of her actions and I said just give me your phone and I'll go through it all for you, so... Yeah, they're the types of things that we sort of deal with. But mm. so you've learned time, to insulate yourself from that. Yeah, I mean we're human, so yeah, sometimes absolutely. you know things get hurt. to you. Um, yeah, there's always people that are going to comment on your game, but we're up, we're open to scrutiny because we are playing a professional sport. It's what irks me is that people don't understand that a lot of us work full time, study. It's a part time competition, but we're expected to be up here, and our time availability we're not busy, we're full, but our time available <laughs> is here. Um, you know, we've got nurses, doctors, police, women, you know, playing, who are doing night shift. And mm. it's just, yeah, I think the more we educate people of where we're at, the better. Mm. Yep. Yeah. Mm. Well answered. So tell us a little bit about your leadership philosophy then. So yeah. your leadership is spoken about very highly. Thank you. And yeah. from my stalking of you, I did see... <laughs> um, my puppy dog? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, oh, your puppy dog's beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. But um, that in, in one of the videos that I saw that you mentioned that you believe you're surrounded by leaders yep. on the field. So there's 16 other leaders around you. Yep. So tell us a little bit about your leadership philosophy and tell us what you stand for as a leader. Oh, that's a really tough question, isn't it? <laughs> um, I'm truly a big believer that you, you can't just have a captain, a vice captain. It's not staggered. It's not a hierarchy system. It's everybody equal. Um, and that's what I focus on. And I mentioned it before, like building relationships for me is, is key. Um, it's funny because we review and we talk about our leadership qualities and those sorts of things and the same sort of characteristics come up for me. And if anything, my the feedback I'm given on my leadership is I need to be harder on the girls or I need to say it how it is. And I respect that and I take that on board. But I think it's important as a leader or as, even as a person, you can't tick every box. So, you know, leadership, you know, leads by example, does all the right things, is a good speaker, whatever it might be. You may not tick all the boxes. And I've sort of learnt to just accept that. Like, I can't, I'm not going to be that hard-ass person that, you know, they probably, with their feedback, that's what they would like. Yeah. Um, and I say, this is me. So I think leadership's based on relationships. Um, if you can build a sustainable culture, which is what we're focusing on at the moment, um, just getting good people and good characters. We draft our girls on character, yeah. football ability, yes, but obviously on character as well because we want good people around the place. And, you know, we've had a turnover of our list. We lose plays every year. It's just the way the competition is. But um, in the first year, we lost, say, like five or so girls and eight, and then eight the next year. Like, it was pretty damning for us. Mm. Um, but I mean this very nicely, but they weren't buying into what we were doing. 
So yeah. the club were not happy to part ways, but they facilitated it. So okay. yeah. Um, yeah, so that's sort of where we sit with that. But just, you know, being genuine, um, being open and honest, I think the teaching side of thing helps everybody. I see myself as a bit of a mentor now. We had 22, sorry, 14 girls under the age of 22 this season. Um, I'm 30, so one of them actually wrote in my 30th birthday card, thanks for being like a mum to me when I got to the club. <laughs> <laughs> so I felt very old and I think that's when I just went, you know, my, and I can't remember what I was saying too, but was it you earlier, Julie? Yeah. Um, like round one, we lost a game by a point and the girls were just distraught. I remember being down at um, GMHBA Stadium in Geelong, you know, 18,000 people standing at the end of the game. They're all just looking at me for something, to give them something, to guide them and these little puppy dog eyes. And that's for me was like, all right, my leadership's not now, win at all costs. I'm gonna lead by example in that regard. It's more mentoring, mentoring and helping these girls, you know, get the best out of themselves. So teaching plays a part. Obviously we all learn differently, you know, hands-on, visual, audio, auditory. Um, so I just sort of tap into that as well. And mm. yeah, I don't know, that's sort of what I stand for, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, relationships are really, really big. Yeah. Um, not afraid to have a hard conversation, but would rather talk to people and mm. get the whole holistic view of what's going on before I have a crack, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. 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 Cause um, I think it's, well, quite a um, perception that often the, the hard ass conversation mm. does not work. Yep for our younger generation, yep. particularly of the 20 year olds. Mm. It's like, they take it differently, especially to how like my generation <laughs> yep. would take it. If someone said, Julia, that was really shit. <coughs> you go, oh God, I really need to improve. So I'll do yes. better next time. So, yep. But you know, it's like, Sarah, that was really shit. It's like, oh. Yeah, and you, you need to know. Really and that's where you need them. to know your players and mm. you need to know your teammates. And you know, I know I can have one conversation a different conversation with this person to that one mm. and I can say it more abruptly to this person. Mm. Um, I'm not overly abrupt, but if I need to, um, I've rarely raised my voice. I've, I've had a crack round two this year. I was probably the most disappointed I've been in the playing group and I brought them in at half time and, you know, just said, pull your heads out of your, you know what? <laughs> um, because we weren't doing what was asked of us and we knew what to do, but mm. I'll never, ask a teammate to do something that I'm not prepared to do myself mm. or that we haven't worked on together. Mm. So, yeah. Love it. Yeah. So sustainable culture is something that you mentioned before. Really, really important. Interesting. Yeah. yeah, really important, especially with, a, like I said, a list that's changing constantly. We want mm. people to want to stay at the club, um, mm. which we achieved this year because we signed everybody we wanted to sign. That's awesome. Yep. So how would you explain your culture? Like, What are the, what are the real key yeah or values that you guys yeah. live by. we the, the club has a set of values um that we sort of adhere to but we like our own values are just about respect um perseverance dedication um and i talk about the one percenters a little so just the little things getting there on time as an example um doing your gym workout properly not having your phone on you um building each other up i think as females it's very easy to be like it's not a I don't know if jealousy is the word, but we tend to look at someone successful and try and find a fault yeah. rather than actually build each other Top up. And, and it's hard. Like You're not going to get along with everybody. There's 30, 31 on our list. There's 31 on our list. Like You're not going to get along with everyone, but we need to find a way that we can all support mm. each other and everybody's different. So, yeah, just those types of things. Mm. Mm. Love it. What are the key things you do to empower? Oh, lead by example. Yeah first and foremost. And like I said before, I won't ever ask anyone to do something I'm not prepared to do, but um, just be really, really genuine. Yeah. Yeah. Really genuine. And I think if you were to ask my teammates and uh, feedback I'm giving is that I'm approachable mm. um, and, you know, I will check in to see how they are. Mm. Um, and that's not to say that's the best way of leadership, but um, that's how I go about it. Um, but we all sort of complement each other as a leadership group. Um, but yeah, just reminding them of why we do what we do, but keeping them grounded at the same time. Mm. Mm. Awesome. So my final question before we open it up to everyone else for um, questions is, and, and you have touched on this, but mm. how how do you want to be remembered? It's a very good question. It, it, that's a hard question. <laughs> it's a very hard question. Um, if I were to, okay, I would like to be remembered as someone who was genuine, mm. who, um, wanted to make people better. Yep. Love it. Yep. Simple, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think I said that on one of my little videos that I did, but yeah, 
the Collingwood sort of philosophy with players, and they're pretty genuine with it, is they want people to leave a better version of themselves at the end of the day. Right. So I take a lot from that, yeah. um, and I hope that I can help along the way. Fantastic. So, yeah, that's me. Thanks. No worries. Amazing. But I just want to um, say a big thank you no for being part of tonight and for what being so generous with what you've shared and <coughs> for sharing little insights as well. Yeah. I think if there's one word I would use to describe you just from meeting you tonight, you're incredibly authentic. Oh, thank you. And you're yeah. so warm and engaging. And like, you know, it's a big thing to walk into a room where you don't know anyone. <laughs> and fun. you just embrace the room. So, um, completely admire you for what you're doing and yeah i'm totally in line with helen in terms of thanking you for paving oh the way for our future little leaders yeah, as you. well and for being a role model in yeah. more ways than one so